Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. After he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. Later that night, he was there alone, and the boat was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, Take courage, it is I. Don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and, beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me! Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said. Why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. Thank you, thank you, thank you for that, that welcome, a big welcome to, to all of those of you joining us uh, in Cafe Church and Leicester, the other centres and online. It's so good to be with you and welcome to part three of this series of looking at the beauty of a transformed life. Now I hope you're enjoying the story of Peter. I, I love Simon Peter, he's been someone I felt an affinity for for many, many years partly because he had the same given name me, Simon. We both have the same birth name. And also because I'm convinced that Peter is actually Greek for Arthur, which is my other name, believe it or not. <laughs> it's not, by the way, for those of you new. Also, I'm convinced that Peter's a Yorkshireman. There, there, I can hear yes going on all around. There's something kind of bold, slightly rude about him at times in his early stages. There's something about him that says to me, it reminds me, not of myself, but of some of the people I used to know and live with when I was growing up. But actually, the other thing I feel a tremendous affinity with Peter with is just this incredible journey of freedom that God takes him on. You know, when, when we first meet him, here's this rough and ready businessman and if you track right to the, the kind of the end of his life, here's a guy who's been polished and shaped and made whole, free from that impetuosity, not perfect, but doing some of the most extraordinary things in life, seeing the sick healed and fulfilling God's plan for his life. Now, when I look at his journey, I think, I feel like I'm going on a similar journey of freedom. You know, if, if you'd know me, when I was a Christian, age 17, that's when I first uh, invited Jesus into my life, you would, have, you would have been amazed to think I'd end up in this place in front of this group of people because I was the shyest person on the planet. I was bound by fear and insecurity. The last thing I wanted to do was to be in front of people speaking. And I would say my life has been, and I'm praying it will be, a testimony not to who I am but to who He is. Jesus, the great liberator, the great deliverer, the one who wants to come and bring freedom to people like you and like me. And whether you're here for the first time or you've been with us on the journey for many years, God still has more for you, more freedom he wants to bring you into. 
Now, what I want to share with you today are three things that we see from this story in the life of Peter. Now, when you think about a journey of living in freedom, and we're going to, over the next two weeks, we're looking at one story this week, and then Dave's going to share another story next week. I think often we think of kind of moments, moments when God seems to break into our life and we move from one level of freedom to another level of freedom, and God wants to do that. They are really important. That's partly why we have things like beta courses and celebrate recovery, where people have moments when God sets them free. But actually, what I want to concentrate on today is three things that we learn from this incident here with Peter that you can apply this day, this week, and you can do them whether you've been with us for two minutes or many, many years. And if you will do these things consistently, God will take you on a journey of freedom. I don't know about you, but I'm glad for what God has done, but I'm looking for more. Anybody else? I believe that God is doing a great work and that actually what lies ahead can be even greater. So I want to give you three really simple things. Here we go. And just to be clear, these things apply right into your circumstances right now. You know, I, I keep hearing God saying to me again and again, Simon, today, right now, this is the best time to learn how to be free. Don't wait until everything's sorted, there are no problems going on, then you can be free. No, I want to free you right in the circumstances that you're living in right now. So here we go, number one, the first simple practice. Number one, recognize the presence of Jesus. Recognize the presence of Jesus. Now, I wonder if you're anything like me and you have to fight the tendency to imagine that Jesus has certain things and places he's happy to be, are the places you don't kind of expect him to be. You know, he's happy at church, he's happy in a Bible study, he's happy in singing nice songs. But actually, when it comes to work, when it comes to leisure, I'm not really sure I'm going to meet Jesus in those circumstances. Now, put yourself in the shoes of the disciples. Peter seems to be the only one, fairly understandably, who recognises that it's Jesus who's actually there with them in the middle of the storm. Now, put yourself in their shoes for a moment. The last time they saw Jesus, he was back on shore. Between him and them, there is probably a few miles by now of storm-filled water and wind. And they're understandably like, not expecting to see Jesus here. It's between three and six in the morning. They're tired. Have you ever been tired? They're afraid. Anyone ever been afraid? They, are, they were actually sent by Jesus, so it's a sense of we're in the middle of God's will, but everything's going wrong. Anyone ever felt like that? Well, that's what's going on in their lives right now. And yet it's Peter who somehow recognises Jesus is here in the midst with us. And his recognising it's Jesus is the turning point. Now, how many of you know, you and I, if you're a Christian here today, you're in a better place than Peter was in? Peter had to rely on, at that point in his life, he had to rely on the physical presence of Jesus. But you and I, Jesus is no longer physically present on the earth. He's gone to be with the Father. He's the God-man at the right-hand side of the Father. But you and I, we can know the presence of Jesus anywhere and everywhere by his Holy Spirit. He can be just as real to you as Jesus was to Peter in that storm. Listen to this promise, which actually Peter would, himself would have had. This is Jesus just before he is ascended to the Father. He says, be sure of this. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. What a glorious, simple, basic gospel truth. God is with you all of the time. There is never a place or a situation that you've been in or that you go to that Jesus is not with you. And this is the key here. This is the turning point for Peter where having recognised Jesus, now he starts to step into freedom. It's realising that it's Jesus in the middle of the storm that makes Peter step out beyond his fears, beyond his insecurities, into a situation where he's actually walking on the very things that have been making him afraid. Recognising Jesus brings freedom. Let, let, let me give you two examples from my own life. Now, I, I know many of you know already that my background was 20 years as a secondary school teacher. And when I, when I look back to my, that, that kind of era of my work life, I recognise that most of us face one of two issues. 
and this will be true for you. Don't look at the people around you, but it'll be true for you. You've either got to deal with fear, insecurity, or you've got to deal with pride. And you'll be somewhere on that spectrum, somewhere in between. For me, unquestionably, first when I started teaching, it was fear and it was insecurity. I think I've probably shared with you how, and that particularly that first year of teaching, I can remember Sunday night before going back into the classroom, going, oh Jesus, tonight will be just a great time for the second coming. <laughs> I really don't want to have to go back in and face those delightful children tomorrow. There, there's absolute fear. But for me, the, the, the way in which I got over that fear that was preventing me being who God had made me to be, the way I started to get over that fear was recognizing that Jesus was with me. I can remember driving to school and going, Jesus, I thank you that you're with me. It doesn't feel like it right now, but I thank you that you are here by faith. I can remember being in the classroom after a lesson had gone hopelessly wrong, saying, Jesus, I thank you that you're still with me and you still love me and I'm still your son. Maybe there's a place in your life where you're a bit like the disciples. It feels like this is not a place where you'd find Jesus. The promise is he's there. Jesus wants you to know in every circumstance you and he is there. You know, whether you're in Leicester right now or you're online, Jesus is with you right now. But he's with you not just in church, he's with you just as much tomorrow morning and Friday evening and Wednesday lunchtime as he is right now. Now, I, I found in my life there's a second way in which recognizing the presence of Jesus has brought freedom in my life. That first way was really about a consistent year. It took, took me probably three years before I really broke through to a place where I loved teaching. Okay, I loved being a secondary school teacher. It was just that consistent recognizing the presence of Jesus, fears being dealt with. But there are other ways in which I've had sudden encounters when I've realized that not only is Jesus with me now, he has always been with me. Uh, just, just recently, I, uh, and I want to say recently, I mean the last few months, uh, I was um, on, on sabbatical in a, a place of prayer with some other people. And I realized how uh, bullying incidents that had happened to me when I was at secondary school many, 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 many years ago was still affecting me today. That actually to a degree... I was bound in the way that I thought and felt and related to other people by things that had happened to me decades earlier. Now, as I, as I prayed about it and brought that incident, and I remembered that I'd been bullied by a boy called Timothy Picton. Can you believe that? I was picked on by Picton. <laughs> <clears throat> and it wasn't anything out of the ordinary. It was just normal school bullying. As I realized, and I remembered a particular incident that happened, as I prayed and realized I wasn't actually on my own. Felt like I was at the time, but actually Jesus was there. Unseen, spoken, but unheard. He was actually there in that classroom with me. Now hear me right, that didn't answer all my questions around why does that stuff happen to people? Why are people so nasty to one another? But what it did in that moment, as I realized the King of Kings, the Liberator himself, hadn't abandoned me at that moment, he was actually there with me. And he was speaking into my heart saying, Simon, I am with you. Simon, I am for you. Breaking the power of the words that were spoken against me in that situation. I can tell you the power of that event was broken. Now that's, that's just a few, few weeks ago. And I'm starting to live in the goodness of what Jesus did as I realized that he was actually there. Do you know, when you realize Jesus has been with you through every single circumstance of life, he has never abandoned you and he will always be with you. As I said, it may not answer all your questions, but there's something about recognizing the presence of God that brings healing and liberty and freedom to our lives. Maybe over the next few weeks as you press in for more of the freedom Jesus wants to bring you. Just ask him to bring to mind, are there particular times when I need to know that you were there and that you were speaking? And why not make it your habit? I encourage you to make this a consistent habit. Not to pray, God please be with me. But to pray, God I thank you that you are with me. Help me recognize your presence. 
They're two different prayers. Jesus is with you all of the time. Learn to recognize his presence. So number one, if we want to grow in freedom, number one, let's recognize the presence of Jesus. Number two, step out on the call of Jesus. In other words, when Jesus asks you to do something, obey him, do what he tells you to do. Now, how, how many of you, give me a wave if you've read Nicky Gumbel's Bible in a year, or you've got the app, or you've used it. Yeah, yeah, quite a few of you. If you want to learn how to read the Bible in a year, I can't recommend too highly Nicky Gumbel's Bible in a year. It's fantastic. Now, in, in that, he talks about one lovely little incident where he was asked to referee a football match with children. Now, he then reveals that he didn't actually know the rules. So if, you, I, I, if I remember rightly, it happened on Clapham Common. So if you can, you can imagine, there's a whole bunch of very enthusiastic nine and ten-year-olds wearing football boots with parents on the outside who are enthusiastically and rather prejudicially calling them on to win. Nicky Gumbel in the middle who doesn't know the rules. Pretty quickly, that football match descended into anarchy. We had kids kicking lumps out of one another. It was an awful situation. And, and then he, he talks about how another parent came in who did know the rules. They brought order in. The, the anarchy ended. And here's the thing. When he, this parent introduced the boundaries, the children started to enjoy the game. They hadn't been enjoying the game before that. Now, when they understood where the boundaries were and they had someone who could enforce those boundaries, suddenly joy and liberty and freedom came. Probably particularly for the winning team, I guess. Do you know, freedom, true freedom, is not, I can do whatever I want to do, whenever I want to do it, to whoever I like. That's what society says. That is not true freedom. True freedom is understanding the Creator has made us in a certain way. He's given us boundaries to live within. And when we live within those boundaries, we come to experience what we were originally made to be. We find freedom like no one and nothing else can give. And this is, this is, this is so important. If you want to live in greater measures of freedom, discover the boundaries that God has created and then respond to live within those boundaries, not because God is a restrictive God, but because he wants to bless you, because he wants to cause you to live in freedom. Now that's what Peter does here. D did you notice that having recognized the presence of Jesus, then Jesus speaks to him, then, then we read this. Peter says, Lord, if it's really you, tell me to come to you walking on the water. Yes, come, Jesus said. So Peter went over the side of the boat and walked on the water toward Jesus. In other words, what does Peter do? Jesus calls. Peter says, uh, he's checked already that it is him. And then Peter puts his foot. You've got you to catch the situation. He puts his foot out of this, the wooden thing. What's that called? It's called a boat. Um, onto the liquidy thing. And what happens to the liquidy thing? It holds him up. The water supports him as he keeps his eyes on Jesus. He trusts Jesus' word and then he steps out in obedience. Now, this is just an important aside. Please note, Peter checked that it was Jesus who was inviting him. How many of you know it would be a stupid thing to do if it wasn't Jesus? Okay, now, now hear that, okay? Sometimes God calls us to do things that look daft. We need to make sure it is God who's calling us to do them. Um, if the bigger the thing, the crazier the thing, make sure it lines up with God's word and that wise counselors have agreed with you. But here, Peter's checked it. He said, is that you, Jesus? Yes, it is. Right, I'm stepping out. He steps out and what does he discover? He discovers that when you take Jesus at his word, when you obey what he's called you to do, freedom comes Liberty comes. The things that were causing me to be afraid, I don't have to be afraid of. I can actually walk on them and the things that were a problem become a footstool for me to put my foot on. Now that's liberty. Peter discovers when you obey Jesus, you can do things you couldn't otherwise do. Now, this principle of kind of trust Jesus and obey him is so important in the whole area of freedom. Um, my wife and I, we, we, we've seen that a number of times in our life. 
Um, one of the areas that I believe God wants to bring us in freedom into increasingly is having absolute confidence that he wants to provide for our every need. How many of you like to have a greater trust in God that he wants to provide for your need? I, I, I certainly do. And that he's on it with your practical everyday needs. And that he wants to not just provide enough, he wants to provide more than that. To bring a liberty, a freedom from materialism and a freedom from the fear of lack. Well, for me and Zia, that journey started 20 years ago when we heard Jesus saying to us, very clear from the Bible, Simon Zia, start giving 10% of your income into the church. Now, I'm going to tell you, our reaction was, no way. <laughs> We're staying in the boat. Okay, the wind was going, don't be daft. How can you possibly live off 10% less and expect to, to, to supply and provide. D don't do it. We decided though, we were going to ignore the wind and the waves for once. We were going to get out of the boat. So we said, okay, we, we put it in. We got out of the boat. And do you know what happened? The water held us up. We were 10% worse off, but it was the first time, I think, ever in our lives that we had money left at the end of the month rather than month left at the end of the money. It's like Jesus doesn't make any sense. There was a new freedom that started to come, a sense of, Father, you really can provide for our needs. And when we step out with you, you release to us. Now, I want to tell you, that was the beginning of a journey. That journey has continued. A few years later, uh, the next call was, okay, <laughs> in a storm, Jesus saying, right, Simon, Zia, now I want you to give over and above the tithe. <laughs> Okay, wind and the waves. Okay, what are you going to do? You're going to trust him that he can hold you up. Are you going to step out? And we went, okay, let's step out. We trusted him. Do you know what happened? The water held us. Jesus' words held us. We found, this doesn't make any sense mathematically, we had more to give away than we'd received. More, more, sorry, we had more to, he gave back to us more. Do you get the idea? There was more to release to other people than we'd actually needed. Then last year, God did it again. He called out to us again. This time it was 2 Corinthians 9, 11, where he said, I want to enrich you in every way so that you can be generous on every single occasion. Now, for us, again, that's been a journey of get your foot out of the boat, trust him that in every place where he wants us to be generous, we can be so. Even where it doesn't look like we've got enough supply because he will provide the supply that we need. And I want to tell you, God has never, ever, ever, ever once let us down on his promises. He has delivered on every single one. But you will never know that until you step out of the boat. Until you actually say, Father, I'm going to trust you. You know, my experience has been both personally and, and as a pastor is that this kind of, if my life has got stuck... If I've stopped getting free spiritually, it's usually, not always, but it's usually because I'm staying in the boat. I've decided I'm not going to live a life of courage and trust in God to take the next step of freedom. Because, you know, God never stops calling us out to new levels of freedom. And it could be for some of you that God is calling you, even today, to new steps of freedom. But you've got to get out of the boat and you've got to trust him that he wants to bring you in to new things. I want to say to you, any area in your life, maybe you could think right now there's an area where you want more freedom. Get hold of the Bible, find out what God is calling you to do and then step out and do what he's telling you to do. You know, our experience has been for many years, God has put such clear boundaries in place and when we step out of those boundaries, we generally end up in bondage. When we get back in them, we end up in freedom. How many of you want to live free in relationships? least five of us. Come on. I think we probably all do. Look at God's order for relationships. It's so simple. We have seen so many people when they choose to obey God's word by forgiving people, there's an instant freedom that comes. When people say, I'm going to get my relationships in order. I'm actually going to do it according to the word. I'm not going to sleep around before I get married. I'm going, to, I'm going to get married to the man or the woman of your choice, Father. That actually you're putting yourself in a place of freedom and protection. And when you step out of that, you're putting yourself potentially long term in a place of bondage. Let's be people who take God at his word, step out on his word and trust him to bring 
new measures of freedom. Third thing, third principle we see. Let's be people who not only are those who are trusting God, stepping out on his word, but thirdly, let's be those who fix our eyes on Jesus. I wonder if you've ever heard the phrase, we become what we behold. We become what we behold. Now, what lies behind that phrase is the thought that whatever dominates my thinking, whatever is largely responsible for the way I behave, is to a degree determining who I am becoming. Now, let let me give you an example. Do we have any dog owners here? Okay, yeah, I have been. I'm not now, but I've been dog owner twice in my life. And I've noticed something about dog owners and their dogs. Anybody else notice there seems to be a kind of a becoming between the two? And I I can't work out, is, is it the dog owners becoming like their dogs? Or is it the dogs becoming like their owners? And just for the record, every dog that we've ever owned has been known for their wisdom, uh, (laughs) intelligence, uh, and all-round good looks. Um, You become what you behold to a degree. Did you notice that here with, with Peter and Jesus? Did you notice that while he's got his eyes on Jesus, while he's looking at him, while he's looking at the one who is the king of creation, the Lord of heaven and earth, who can walk on the, the wind and the waves, so does Peter. Courage rises with his eyes on Jesus. But as soon as he takes his eyes off them, and we read, when he saw the strong wind and the waves, he was terrified and he began to sink. What happens? Eyes on Jesus, courage, boldness, fears broken, able to do what God has called me to do, eyes off Jesus, immediately he begins to sink and it's like those bondages take over. Now, what we give our eyes to, what we put our life on, will always determine who and what we become. Um, Some of you, many of you will will know, my personal story is I became a Christian at 17, but actually when I became a Christian, internally there was a lot of brokenness largely due to the fact that my dad had been killed in a car accident when I was 11. And at that point, even as a born-again, filled with the Spirit Christian, do you know, a lot of my life was focused on the pain of what had happened as a result of my dad's death. And it was almost like that rejection, that fear, that sense of isolation dictated to a degree the way in which I I related to other people, the way in which I related to God, and my lived experience of freedom. And some of that was because I was allowing my whole kind of thinking, acting, pursuing things to be determined by what I was beholding. Now that began to change for me through the two things I'm talking about here really, by an encounter with God and then by a habit of more and more focusing on God. For me, it began when I had an experience in prayer where I felt God, not orally, but but kind of in my heart, speak to me and say to me, as he took me back to that event when my dad had died, and he he said, first of all, I saw that he was with me, and I, I felt him speak to me, Simon, I'm your dad now. Now, all I can say is, from that moment, it was like that sense that I was an orphan got broken. The sense that I was isolated and rejected began to recede and a new confidence started to rise up. As I began to realize from that incident and then reading the Bible, praying, worshipping, I began to realize I'm not an orphan. I'm a son of the King. I'm a child of the Most High God. (laughs) I'm a man of purpose and destiny on whom God has placed his hand. I'm not rejected, I'm loved. I'm chosen, I'm forgiven. And for me, what began to change was as I had an an encounter and then a discipline really of time alone with God, those things that had bound me, that caused me to, to stop doing things or never want to do things, they started to fall away. Because the condition of my heart was changing, the focus of my life was changing. Uh, Paul, in 2 Corinthians 3.18, he puts it this way. In a context where he's talking about freedom, he says, We all, he's talking now about, if you're a Christian, he's talking about you. We all with unveiled face, beholding. In other words, looking at. Okay, not, not physically, but you behold from the heart, you sense his presence. 
beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed. Beholding changes you. Are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another degree of glory. Look at the wonder of that verse. What, what does God want to do in your life? He wants to change you from one degree of glory to another degree of glory to another degree of glory to another degree of glory. And what's the image that you're being made into? It's Jesus. As you behold who He is, as you worship Him, as you spend time reading the Word, as you think about Him, you are starting to behold Him and He starts to change you. Freedom comes step by step, day by day, week by week, as you say, I'm not going to fixate on my problems. I'm not going to fixate on the difficulties I've got. I'm going to learn to fixate on Jesus. I'm going to make him the one whom I behold. Let me ask you a question. You know, at the moment, um, it's getting dark in the evenings. When you get home to your house in the evening, assuming you're the first there, do you, do you go into your house and chase out the darkness? Do you go in, open the door, go on, darkness, get out of the house. Get out. Anybody do that? You all look at me like, thankfully, like, no, we don't do that, Simon. What do you do? Switch on the light. And what does darkness do when the light comes on? It doesn't cling a bit, does it? Like, oh, in the middle of the room, clinging on a bit. It's gone. Do you know? When we learn to switch on the light, when we learn to get our focus off the power of the darkness and onto the wonder of Jesus, often the darkness will just flee. Now there is a place for booting out. Thank you. There's a place for booting out darkness. But I tell you what, when you get the light switched on, when you learn consistently again and again and again to worship Jesus, lift up his name over your life, to praise him, did you not find when you, when you gather with the rest of the church family and you worship, it does something in your innermost being. It's because you're beholding Jesus. And as you behold him, you become like him. He is the image we're being made into. And he is the most whole, the most lively, full of life human being there has ever been. And God is making you into that picture. That's what freedom is about. It's becoming more and more like the totally liberated Jesus himself. I, I, I love this quote from Robert Murray McChain. He's quoted in Michael Reeves' book, Christ Our Life. He, put it like, he puts it like this. He says, learn much of the Lord Jesus. For every look at yourself, take 10 looks at Christ. He is altogether lovely, such infinite majesty, and yet such meekness and grace. And all for sinners, even the chief, bask in his beams, feel his all-seeing eye settled on you in love, and repose in his almighty arms. Let your soul be filled with a heart-ravishing sense of the sweetness and excellency of Christ and all that is in him. Do you know, I, I, I want to say to you, do you know, when I first started preaching many years ago, I only had one message, which was read the Bible and pray. Do you know, I think I've still only got one message. It's read the Bible and pray. Do what Jesus tells you to do. If like Peter, you're in a storm right now, fix your eyes on Jesus. Get your eyes on the one who is above the wind and the waves. If you feel like you're sinking, like Peter did, Call out to Jesus and say, Jesus, I've messed up. Catch me. Jesus, catch me. Get your eyes on the one who's in the wind and the waves, who will lift you up and restore you. Try and get your eyes off the wind and the waves and get your eyes on the king. And seriously, if your life right now is very calm, if you experience Jesus in the boat, then take time to get to know him more and more and more. Say, Jesus, make me more like you day by day that I may reflect you in every place I go. You know, that whole principle of looking to be changed is picked up elsewhere in the Bible, particularly for a day that's going to happen for all of us. Do you know, there will come a day for all of us, either when we die or when Jesus comes again, when, as Paul says, we're not going to see him as through a glass darkly going to see him face to face. Do you know, there will be a moment, and part of me can't wait for that moment, when I actually see Jesus. Not, not just from my heart, but physically in front of me. And what the Bible says in 1 John 3 verse 2 is when we see him, we will be like him. 
Do you know, whatever you're going through right now, whatever the bondages are you want to get free of, I have a guarantee for you. One day, all of them will be gone. All sickness gone, all fear gone, all insecurity gone. And more than that, you will get to experience the life that is in Jesus. You will be like him. I don't know when that's going to be for you. I don't know when it's going to be for me. But you have a glorious future. But I want to say between now and then, whenever it is, let's be people who keep pressing in for moving like, like Peter did from one degree of glory, taking the next step to the next degree of glory, not settling for where we are, but saying, Jesus, do a greater work in me. Jesus, do a greater work in me. Let's be those who just be consistent with recognizing Jesus in the midst of our everyday life. Let's be those who step out in obedience to his call. Let's be those who keep beholding him. Let me pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you are indeed the great liberator, the one who has paid for each one of us to come into increasing measures and levels of freedom. And Father, I, I pray for each of us that you would put within us a diligent discipline to just day by day, week by week, to be pursuing these three disciplines and habits. And I pray that as we do, we will see at times imperceptibly at times radically, new measures of freedom. And I pray, Father, that we may live with a, a testimony of great gratitude to Jesus for all he's done in our lives. In Jesus' name. If you agree with that, say aloud, Amen.